As we address immigration issues in Parliament, um, I have to say that there's an overwhelming feeling of this complete lack of urgency from the Department of Home Affairs. So whether we're talking about how do we process visas, visa applications of investors that want to come into South Africa, or whether we are talking about processing asylum applications um, and, 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 and doing those speedily uh, so that we can determine who has a legitimate claim and who should uh, be deported, for example, there, there's just a complete lack of urgency. And I think, you know, it, it's this leadership gap that is, is, is a big problem that the DA has been trying to address uh, with Home Affairs on migration issues. And we look at what is happening in, in, in the absence of that leadership um, in, in our townships in the last few days. And the fact is that, that people are starting to feel they need to take things into their own hands and they need to, to, to take actions themselves. And, uh, you know, we, we have a, a national action plan which was actually uh, implemented and signed off by the cabinet uh, of the Republic of South Africa, uh, which states that we should never go back to a point in time in this country where persons are categorized because of their color, creed, or nationality, where they are, are categorized, and then they are separated into a group that is treated the same. And this is a big challenge, um, especially with, with terminology with the Department of Home Affairs, because we talk about foreigners, whereas there are a variety of foreigners. And you know, we, we're so focused now on how do we take the diminishing pie, the economic pie that is in South Africa, how are we going to split that up? How are we going to now create a quota for that? And, and we've seen loud and clear, I think we've had quotas in various forms for the last 20 years at least. Have they worked? Have they really created jobs? And so an immigration policy, it's really about creating jobs. And there's a f such a focus on the negative side of things. And this is why the DA has come out and said that we need a migration policy that focuses on the opportunity, the opportunity for all. And so the DA is, is really engaged in working on the whole thing of the process of processing visas for persons that want to invest in South Africa, that want to work here, the skills that we need, and also processing asylum applications. So to give you an example, it takes roughly 10 years from when somebody enters South Africa and says that I'm applying for asylum or refugee status. It takes roughly 10 years for them to go through the process and find out yes or no. And in the meantime, we have this situation of uncertainty. And so what the DA has done, we had this backlog at 68 years, uh, so, so about two years ago. And through our pressure, we were able to reduce this. Uh, the United Nations, uh, the, the UNHCR came on board, provided some lawyers, and we were able to drastically start reducing that time frame. Um, but without the DA's intervention, nothing was going to happen there. And we see this in our refugee reception uh, offices. So if we look at uh, Durban, Pretoria, Messina, uh, that is fine, but other refugee, uh, refugee reception offices are closed. So for example, in Cape Town, it's taken almost two years uh, since a court order to open the refugee reception office, and it still isn't open. So despite being court ordered, and uh, there are excuses of contractor not being available and not having the money, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially there's a lack of will to say that persons that come in, present themselves and say that I'm a refugee or, or I have an asylum claim, um, are not being allowed to, to have that claim processed. And we should know, yes, is it a legitimate claim? No, is it not? And if it is not, then there should be a process that is followed. And so we need rule of law, we need action from our national government. So I, along with, uh, with other um, colleagues, We'll be going to the, the various refugee, refugee reception offices that are still closed and talking to stakeholders about what the consequences are for these persons. And again, we've got to understand we are not in a continent uh, where, 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 they, where everybody experiences freedom, fairness and opportunity. Uh, that, that, you know, the, 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 these are the, the foundation stones of the DA and diversity. So persons don't e experience that. And we have a scenario where even the freedom of speech of these persons has been taken away with regulations, that they are not allowed to speak out against those governments. And so certainly this is something that we are, are going to take on in the strongest of terms, that these, these uh, claims should be adjudicated speedily so that everybody knows. If you are in South Africa, you've applied for something and you are here, you're either awaiting a, a decision um, 
and, and that is going to happen speedily. Now, you know, I've touched on the, the, the items of the asylum seeker backlog. But I think another factor is, you know, we've had, I think it's been in four of President Silva Ramaphosa's State of the Nation speeches, we've heard about the e-visa system. So we've heard the e-visa system is coming since the very first one. And it's, it's been addressed as a key priority to create jobs, to bring in investors, to bring in skilled persons, and to make that uh, happen in a hurry. And uh, it, it beggars belief that the, the Minister of Home Affairs has not been called to account for why years later this still hasn't happened. So there was an announcement towards the end of last year that these, uh, these e-visa systems will be rolled out by now, by March. And when we asked a question recently in Parliament about where we are with that, the answer was so vague that it's clear that they're, they're actually not ready. And the key thing, as Gwen has pointed out, is that there are two aspects to an e-visa system. So the one aspect is the website that you can actually go on and do your application uh, on. And then the other one is the central adjudication hub. And what such a, what such a system would do is it would separate the applicant from, from a person as much as possible. And this reduces the, 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 the possibilities for corruption. So you wonder why is it taking so long and why is the minister not being held to account? But this is something the, the e-visa system absolutely has to be rolled out now. We've been decimated by the lockdown regulations, the draconian lockdown regulations. We need people that can come here as tourists, um, as, as skilled investors. Now, I'll give you an example of, you know, the fact that these visas are not being adjudicated fast enough, um, what the impact is. And there is something called the Global Retirement Index. And on that Global Retirement Index, there are countries like Panama and Ecuador, which are at the top of that list. And these are high net worth individuals that, that don't want to retire in a, in a cold country. They want to go somewhere warm and, and lovely and tour around. So these people spend on average between 28 and, and, and 36,000 rand a month. They buy a house for between three and a half and five million. They spend money on all the uh, maintenance of that. They have their own medical aid. And there is a whole industry around these persons. And yet in South Africa, you are forced to apply from outside the country and, and wait. And these people simply run out of patience and they go somewhere else where they're allowed to come into the country temporarily while the application is being uh, adjudicated. And then they come and stay here. And essentially, you've lost someone that is living like a tourist and uh, investing in a job creating industry. Now, you know, what we are presented with um, because of this is this false choice. And, you know, this false choice says that attracting foreign investment, um, business and skills means that we're not putting South Africans first. Um, but clearly, it's, it's exactly the opposite. And so the DA will be introducing a, a private members bill into Parliament uh, for a skills-based uh, or a, uh, sorry, a points-based migration system. And what this will do is try and attract uh, high net worth individuals, persons with, that, that are skilled, that are able to uh, bring in knowledge, that are able to create jobs and create opportunities. And we have South Africans that are desperate to work, desperate for an opportunity. And we need to match those people together. We need as many people in South Africa as possible, whether they're South African or wh wherever they were born, to create those opportunities. And so we believe this points-based migration system is going to be um, a, a great boost to our economy. And we're not the only ones. The World Economic Forum um, in their research has found that these um, points-based systems are far more effective in attracting skilled uh, migrants than the current system that we have. In terms of the Border Management Authority, I think we, we've, we've really having to come to terms with what is going on there. And the situation where we desperately need border patrols going up and down the borders to stop persons going around uh, the border posts and direct them to our border posts. But instead, we, we are seeing the creation of a border management authority, which is a, a home for millionaire managers. And then these millionaire managers are being appointed while the borders remain uh, open. We, we're losing time. And so re really what, what we are pushing for as the DA is for the government to say, either the Treasury must come and say that the border management authority is fully funded and it will be funded for the entire rollout. So this means the management structure and all of the support staff, or they must stop it and they must become a coordination agency because that is what the 
uh, socioeconomic uh, impact assessment recommended uh, for that bill. They recommended that that be a coordination agency, which is actually the DA's policy. Okay, so in summary, migration is really supposed to be a, a vehicle to create opportunities and jobs. And uh, government research has shown that uh, in Gauteng, for example, uh, foreign-owned stores uh, employ twice as many South Africans as South African-based stores. And uh, so it's against this backdrop that I wish to hand over to my colleague uh, Michael Carter to discuss the labour issues around migration. Thanks very much, Adrian. I think what we've seen in recent times is a scapegoating of foreign nationals who are essentially being blamed for South Africa's unemployment crisis. And politicians are fanning the flames of this phenomenon through populist campaigns like, for example, Operation Dudula. And the government itself now seems to have latched onto this with the recent publication just last week of its draft national labor migration policy. And we as the DA reject this kind of very inward-looking, insular, chauvinistic, xenophobic bandwagoning. And the labor aspects of our migration policy steer away from the language of fear, and as Gwen has spoken about, focus more on the language of opportunity. We must remember that foreign nationals often help to oil the wheels of our economy. They pay rent and taxes, they transfer skills, they transfer know-how and knowledge, and they purchase goods and services which contribute to South Africa's revenue base. Foreign migrants are also often job creators. A 2018 study, which has been referenced earlier, conducted by the OECD and the International Labour Organization, found that labor, migrant laborers often contribute significantly to the South African economy. They generally do not displace locally born workers. They can help to raise GDP by up to 5%. They can have a positive effect on the government's fiscal balance through the payment of income tax and value-added tax, and they are more often than not well integrated into the labour market, and they create additional employment. By contrast, what we've seen with the draft national labour migration policy issued by the ANC is that it tends to posit foreign nationals as the other to be feared. And the document itself rests on two conceptual flaws. Firstly, it tends to suggest that foreign nationals are primarily responsible for South Africa's sky-high unemployment rate, which now sits, as you know, at 46.6% on the expanded definition. And this really, this uh, is a textbook piece of scapegoating, this impulse to deflect to blame, to label, and to other. South Africans can't find jobs, not because of foreign national workers, it's because the ANC has essentially run the economy into the ground through policy incoherence, through uh, mismanagement, through corruption, through state capture, through big picture policy items which deter investors and sap economic growth. Our labor laws and our labor regulations, which are onerous and rigid, also have played and continue to play a significant role in our unemployment crisis. The other thing about this draft national labor migration policy is that the government seems to depart from the premise that there is a, a finite pie of job opportunities which need to be divvied up and parceled out. And that's why the Minister of Employment and Labour signalled that he intends to slap quotas on the number of documented foreign nationals who can be employed in certain sectors like agriculture, construction, tourism, hospitality, 
and the like. And we as the DA regard this as a very short-sighted and xenophobic move. It reeks of populism and it won't actually have a shred of impact on our unemployment crisis. We're misdiagnosing things here and we're focusing on the wrong solutions. Now, the national labor migration policy also goes hand in hand with proposed amendments to the Employment Services Bill. And these proposed amendments would enable the Minister of Employment and Labor to set quotas per economic sector, occupational category, or geographical area. And we've seen this tendency in other pieces of legislation piloted through Parliament by the Minister of Employment and Labour, notably uh, the Employment Equity Amendment Bill, which also introduces a quota system. But this particular manoeuvre in the uh, Employment Services Bill will set a very dangerous precedent because statutory employment quotas are a very regressive, draconian measure and most likely unconstitutional too. They are redolent, really, of some of the most backward-looking regimes. If you look at history, what tends to happen in moments of national crisis when the economy is floundering is that the other is always looked for. You always look to blame somebody else. And unfortunately, what's happened in South Africa today is that foreign nationals have been identified as the other, blamed and scapegoated, for our unemployment crisis, which has other causes. There are also mooted amendments to the Small Business Act aimed at preventing foreign nationals from establishing and operating small, medium and micro enterprises and from even trading in certain sectors of the economy. Again, this impulse is profoundly draconian and quite frankly preposterous. In short, Legally entrenched quotas are a throwback to the dark past of apartheid and to the practice of job reservation. And that was actually dumped into the dustbin of history, job reservation, in 1979, long before our transition to democracy. As usual, what the national labor migration policy demonstrates is that the ANC is stuck in the past. We need to focus on the real causes of unemployment and not scapegoat foreigners. The cost of xenophobia is very high. It stunts economic potential by deterring investment, tourism and cross-border trade, and it risks making South Africa a pariah in Africa and in the global arena. What we should be doing is looking to attract immigrants with critical skills and making it as easy as possible for them to come to South Africa because there's a positive correlation between skilled immigration and economic growth.